so much. It's, it's your, just, just remember he said, it's your effort that's made this possible. So while you're on your feet, everybody grab your Bible. Now I grew up in a traditional Pentecostal church. We stood while we read the scripture. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't always do that, but I do like to get you to make a declaration before we receive the word tonight. So if you grab whatever you're using for a Bible and hold it up, just say this to me. Say, this is my Bible. God's holy word. Written by my creator. It's the operational manual for life. If I do what it says, I will succeed and life will go well. If I don't, it won't, so I will. I believe that this word is true and I'll receive it tonight with a joyful heart. I declare, I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Tonight, as I taught the Word of God, I declare, my life is going to be transformed. And I'll never be the same again. In Jesus' name. Alright, you can be seated. Take your Bibles and open them with me, if you will, to the book of Mark's Gospel. Mark chapter 5. And... Give me a few minutes to comment, as I normally like to do, and then we'll read part of it. Mark chapter 5. said, I suppose, if everything Jesus said and did were recorded, all the volumes of the books of the world would not be able to, to, uh, rec or, or to record everything that Jesus said and did. The point that I'm trying to get across to you is that in all of these multitudes, as Jesus went through the cities and the towns of Galilee, ministering the word of God, and the sick were healed, and the blind were, uh, uh, received their sight, and the crippled walked, all through these um, through these villages there were profound testimonies. I'm convinced if we would sit down and do an interview with those multitudes and those crowds, we could find stories that were just as compelling as the ones that were recorded in the Scripture. But for some reason, they weren't chosen by the Gospel writers to be a part of the record. So the question is, then why? I, I believe that the miracles that are recorded are recorded for at least three reasons. First of all, remember Jesus came to reveal the heart of the Father. He wanted us to understand that God is good. Aren't you glad that God is good? That He's not angry. That He doesn't have anger management problems. He's not walking through heaven looking for a reason to judge and condemn. He's not looking for an exclusion clause so that He can rule you out of the blessing. He is a good God. He cares about His people. John chapter 20 and verse 31 that these things were written that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that believing we might have life in His name. In other words, He performed signs and wonders and miracles to confirm His identity. So He was revealing the heart of the Father. He was confirming His identity. But then there's a third element. I believe that the miracles that are recorded were chosen by God to speak to us 
So that each of us could understand that no matter what our need or our situation is, there is no problem that God cannot repair. There's no issue that God cannot address. There's no bondage that God cannot set you free from. There's no sickness that God cannot heal. There's no calamity that can come into your life that God cannot turn around. Can somebody put an amen on that today? And so it's to teach us about us that with every situation that is revealed, we can identify, we can relate, we can see something in that story that applies to where we are today. Now what I find interesting is I read the miracles of Jesus, and I, I told you last night, I recently went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and I reread every miracle that Jesus performed, every miracle recorded in the Scriptures by the prophets, um, by, by, any, by any of the apostles, all of, this, all of the miracles in the Scriptures. And what I found interesting is, specifically about the miracles of Jesus, is that there was never a situation that Jesus was ever in that he was at a disadvantage. There was never a circumstance or a situation that arose in his life where he was in panic that he didn't know what to do. He arose to the occasion every time there was a problem. Every time there was a crisis, he responded. Every time there was a need, he had a solution. He exercised dominion and authority over every imaginable type of situation that mankind could ever address. In just these two chapters alone, chapter 4 and 5, you see Jesus dealing with destruction, demons, disease, and death all in a matter of two chapters. He calms a storm that's about to bring down a ship. And then he casts demons out of a man that was tormented to the point that they couldn't bind him with chains. And then he heals a woman that had been tormented by a disease or had been, uh, 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 had been uh, ravished by a disease for 12 years and then he raises a little girl from the dead. All in two chapters. I think the message that God is trying to get across to us is clear. And that is, your extremity is God's opportunity. I, I want you to say that out loud. Say, man's extremity is God's opportunity. No, no, no. Say, say it with me again. Say, man's extremity is God's opportunity. What, what does that mean, Pastor Jim? That means when you come to the end of your rope. How many have ever been to the end of your rope? How many have done all you can do? You've tried everything there is to try. And you've come to the conclusion that there's no natural or physical solution to your problem. That's when God wants you to know, I'm still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm still the God that performed miracles when I walk the shores of Galilee. And I'll come into your marriage. I'll come into your finances. I'll come into your hospital room. Whatever's going on in your life, I am still up to the challenge. I can still do miracles. Can somebody give Jesus a shout of praise in this house tonight? chapter. Just give me a few minutes to work through it. And, and, and again, I said, like I said, I won't be long, but I just want to work through this process. Jesus has returned from ministering among the Gadarenes. It's an amazing story. He cast demons uh, out of a man that was so tormented they couldn't find him to change. And Jesus doesn't have to sing blood songs and, you know, sling sweat and beg and plead. I mean, the devil begged for opportunity to get out when Jesus showed up. Come on now. Yeah, I, I was I was in a service one time with my with my dad who's going to be with the Lord and I, I watched these preachers trying to cast devils out of this young man. And they've been trying, they were singing, they were shouting, they were sweating, they were pushing her, shoving her up and down, anointing her with oil, doing all kinds of stuff, and the devil was just mocking them and they're finding and computing and doing all this. It went on for like two hours. We're sitting in the back talking and finally he said, excuse me for just a moment. He gotta be walked down there and he did something. Bam! That girl hit the floor. And he told those, those preachers, he said, I mean, when she gets up, you just pray for the Savior to fill the Holy Ghost. And, you know, if you need some help, let me know. And he walked back, set that down, and he said, what were we talking about? I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're not going to do that to me. I said, what did you do? I said, those guys have been trying for hours to cast those devils out. He said, no, they weren't trying to cast the devils out. 
They were trying to convince themselves they had power over the devil. He said, when you know you got power over the devil, you just tell him to do it and he listens to you. I said, what did you say? He said, I just said, devil, come out of her in the name of Jesus. I said, that's all you said? He said, that's, that's all I said. I said, well, why did it work for you when it didn't work for them? He said, because I know the authority I have in the name of Jesus. Oh, and the devil has to obey. Amen. That changed my whole perspective. I realized you don't have to beg the devil. You don't have to bargain with it. Come on, is anybody listening to me? I think a lot of times we're trying to convince ourselves when really if we understood the authority and the power that we have in the name of Jesus, we could speak and mountains would be removed and cast into the sea. Jesus casts the devils out. The swine uh, are feeding nearby and they run into the swine and the swine fall off the cliffs and the ground. Uh, and the ground. Jesus gets in a boat and he goes back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to a city called Capernaum. Word has spread all through that region of the miracles that are taking place. So the crowd flocks. They've come from all the surrounding villages. He is surrounded by a multitude of people. Everybody that's sick and suffering and hurting is there hoping to receive a miracle. But as soon as he gets off the boat, everybody says somebody. Uh, come on, talk to me. Everybody say a somebody. A somebody by the name of Jairus, who is a leader in the synagogue, a bigwig in the community because he was a religious leader, comes to Jesus and he says, my daughter is sick, she's at the point of death, and Jesus said, I'll go in here. So as he's going at a fast pace, that are in a hurry to go to where this girl is and pray for her, the multitude is following him. Some of them are just observing, wanting to see what's going on. Others were battling their own sicknesses and diseases, and diseases hoping that they might get a chance to receive healing themselves. Into this crowd of people comes a woman. Who's a nobody. Everybody say Somebody. somebody. And a nobody. This is a woman that we know very, very little about. Church history records that she was from Caesarea Philippi, which was about 30 miles away. At a normal walking pace, that would have taken two and a half days for her to walk from Caesarea or from um, uh, Caesarea Philippi to Capernaum. In her condition, it probably was twice that. The Bible tells us a little bit about this woman. She was destitute. She was diseased. She was suffering from many issues. Her first issue was she had a physical problem. She was, she was dealing with a physical ailment that the doctors could not cure. It was a physical disease that she had suffered from from twelve or suffered from for twelve years. Everybody say 12 years. 12 years. Imagine suffering from the same infirmity and disease every day for 12 years. Seeking every form of treatment that she could find and nothing would help. And the Bible said instead of getting better, she was only worse. She was suffering from a physical issue, but that was not the biggest of her issues. She was not only suffering physically, but she was suffering emotionally. Now I want you to think, not in 21st century mindset, but I want you to think about the mindset among the ancient Jewish people. You see, according to the law, she was ceremonially unclean. She was marked. She was distinguished. There was something about her that separated her from everybody else and she lived with that title or that label on her life. She was emotionally destitute at one time. I'm sure she had hopes and dreams just like everybody else. She wanted to be a mother and a wife and bear children because that was the, 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 uh, the, the highest measure of value of a woman's life in that era is if you could bear children, especially sons. 
And so she grew up with those dreams and with those desires. And she had, no doubt, she had desires of things that she wanted to do and, and, and a life that she wanted to live. And she had all of this future ahead of her planned out. And then one day, her body begins to show symptoms of a disease that gets worse and worse and continues for 12 years. And now, one by one, her dreams begin to die. Every day she is emotionally battered because she can't even mingle in the general community of believers or community of Israel without crying out everywhere she goes unclean. The Jewish people with their pharisaical haughtiness would mock her and rebuke her because in their mindset, if you had a sickness or a disease or a deformity, it was because either you had sinned or someone in your family had sinned, and it was a sign of God's displeasure in your life. You remember the man that was born blind that was sitting outside the city, and Jesus walked by and the disciples said to Jesus, did this man sin, or did his parents sin so that he's born blind? And Jesus said, neither. This happened so that the glory of God could be revealed. But in their minds, they were thinking there was something wrong with this woman. And so she was mocked. She was ridiculed. When she tried to go out into public, mothers would grab their babies and pull them away. And she would have to cry out, unclean, unclean. She lived with the stigma of this disease. Mocked. Ridiculed. Unfortunately, even some people that preach this passage claim that she was a prostitute. There's absolutely zero biblical historical evidence to support that. But she still, even to this day, 2,000 years later, carries the stigma of her sickness and her disease. She was emotionally battered. She wasn't just physically and emotionally destitute. She was spiritually destitute. Do you realize that she could not even attend the synagogue and worship with the rest of the Jewish nation. She had no way of hearing the Scriptures. She had no way of being ministered to. She could be stoned for trying to mingle in the general public. She was physically destitute. She was emotionally battered. She was spiritually destitute. And she was financially broke. The Bible said she had spent all she had there's nothing better than what it works. I want you to see beyond the surface into the assumptions of the person. Because if you can seek medical treatment for 12 years before your resource runs out, you had to have at one point been a person of means and financial status. At one time, she was a somebody. Now she is a nobody. All her money is gone. And how do you know when your money is gone, most of your friends are gone? Come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. But you, you, you get the point. And so here is a woman that's bleeding physically, but she's also bleeding emotionally. She's, she's battered. She's, she's, she's emotionally bruised. She is physically suffering. She is spiritually suffering. And she is financially broke. And I believe that this is where we get a glimpse into the war room of Satan where he sits with his imps and he plans his strategies of destruction. You see, I believe that one of Satan's most prolific snares is to bring circumstances and situations into our life. Not one, but circumstance after circumstance, issue after issue, problem after problem, attack after attack. It's one thing after another thing until he breaks us down and he gets us so overwhelmed by our condition that we forget about our position in Christ. Yeah. He causes so much pain, so much discomfort, so much hurt that we begin to accept the lies that He is speaking. And as soon as He can penetrate our minds and begin to get us to believe that that's what we are, it's what we become. And this is His strategy. But listen, I've come with good news for you tonight. It doesn't matter what you've been through. I want you to know that God has not changed His mind about you. He still loves you. He still believes in you. And He's still able to turn your situation around. Can somebody put a big shout of amen in the house today? I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you four quick words. The first word is defined. Everybody say defined. Define. The first thing I want you to see is this woman 
was defined by her issue. Now notice the text doesn't say anything about her name. Could have been Sue. Could have been Sherry. Could have been Heather. Could have been Amber. We all know a crazy Amber, don't we? <laughs> we, we, don't know, we don't know what her name was. We know who Jairus was. Because he was a somebody. But we don't know who she was. Nowhere in the text is her name given. Was it Betty? Was it Mary? Was it Sue? What was her name? She was simply known as, listen, she was simply known as the woman with the issue of blood. Her circumstance and situation had become the distinguishing mark upon her life. And her issue had defined her. How often does that happen? To people still today. Their circumstance and their issue is so overwhelming that it becomes the preeminent thing in their lives. That's the person that used to be named Philip the Black. That's the man that cheated on his wife. That's the woman that went through a divorce. That's the couple that filed bankruptcy. That's the homosexual. That's the lesbian. That's the drug addict. Come on, is anybody listening to what I'm talking about? Somebody asked a question like this, how can you tell who the vegan in the room is? You don't have to. They'll let you know as soon as you bring up the issue of food. Come on, am I right? How many vegans do we have? Be honest. We rate, just wave that hand. Nobody's willing to identify themselves. That's right. That's right. But this woman, this woman was defined by her issue. Instead of being Ruth or Betty or whoever she was named to be. And you see, among the Jews, a name had a prophetic destiny attached to it. Instead of being seen as a woman with value and potential and destiny and something locked up on the inside of her that needed to be released, she was simply known as the woman with the issue of blood. Defined. The second word I want to give you is disqualified. Everybody say defined. Define. Disqualified. Her issues had defined her. And according to the ceremonial law had disqualified her. Her life had come down to what you can't and what you'll never be able to do. You can't be a preacher because you went through divorce. You can't teach Sunday school because you've been in prison. You can't work here because you're a felon. You can't do this because of that. And the, the other part is not only you can't, but you'll never, you'll never go to college. You'll never own a home. You'll never get out of debt. You'll never own a business. You'll never find a husband. You'll never find a wife. You'll never find love or love again. How do you understand what I'm talking about? She had an issue that was so profound, it defined her and in the minds of people around her disqualified. And isn't it amazing how when life is going good, how everybody's loving on you and wanting to hang out with you. They want to be your friend. They're inviting you over to, to Denny's and they, you know, they, they, they want to go to uh, Knott's Berry Farm and they, they want to go to the beach and all this kind of stuff. But when you got a real issue, I, I'm not talking about you know, a twist in your ankle. I'm talking about a rash that gets all over your body. Or I'm talking about at the point of a nervous breakdown. Or I'm talking about when you don't have any money and your house is about to be foreclosed on and you don't know how you're going to keep the lights on next month. Isn't it amazing how all those people that were there and all those people that want to be wanted to be around you are nowhere to be found. We bail out on people when they have real issues. She was defined. Disqualified. Here's the third word. She was determined. Everybody say those words with me. Everybody say defined. Disqualified. Determined. You know what I most love about this woman? Is she got up in the morning every day for 43 
380 days with the same issue. Everybody around her had decided that her issue was unsolvable. Even the doctors had said there's nothing we can do to help you. But there's something on the inside of this woman that caused her, my God, this excites me, caused her to get up every day and say it didn't work yesterday, but I want to try something else today. Amen. This is a woman that said, I'm not going to quit. I am not going to let my past determine my future. I'm not going to let the pain of yesterday rob me of the potential of tomorrow. Here was a woman that would not quit. And when life knocked her down, she got back up again and said, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know I'm going to find a solution to this problem. Can somebody shout a big amen to me? And the Bible says in verse 27, and when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. I want you to see what's going on. She is in Caesarea Philippi. And she's at the lowest moment. The doctors have said there's nothing we can do. And somebody says, well, you know what? I heard about a man in Capernaum. Some people are even suggesting that he might be the Messiah. And he's healing the sick and he's casting out devils. And miracles are taking place. And the more they talk, the more her ears perked up. She's like, tell me more about this man. What's his name? Where is he at? And she's listening to all of these things that they're saying. And then in the process of her thinking, something clicked on the inside of her. And she said, if I can just get to where he is, if I can just touch the tassel on his robe, if, if, if I can just get close enough, he doesn't have to touch me, just let me get close enough to touch him. If I can just touch him, I know I will be made whole. But she's 30 miles away. Listen, I know folks that won't drive 30 miles in an air-conditioned automobile with 12-way seats and all the luxuries and all of the, you know, all the bells and whistles of a, 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 of a modern car. Come on, is anybody listening to me? Here is a woman that's weak. Here is a woman that is sick. Here is a woman that is spiritually and physically and emotionally and financially destitute. But she said, I'm not going to stay in this condition. And she said, I've got to get to where Jesus is. And so she gets up and she begins that journey. We don't know if it was two days. We don't know if it was three days. We don't know if it took her an entire week to get there. Do you realize if she slept on a bed that was not her own, it had to be burned the next day. Nobody would give her a ride. Nobody would help her all along the path. She's dealing with her rejection. She's dealing with her pain. She's dealing with her sickness. She may not have had food to eat because she was completely broke, but something on the inside of her said, I cannot quit. And she just kept pressing on and kept pressing on until she sees him in the crowd. And he's surrounded by a multitude. And somebody said, you don't understand. He's not healing the sick today. He's not laying hands on anybody. He's not touching anybody. She said, that's all right. I've gone through too much. I paid too big of a price to be here. I'm not going to be where he is and not get what he's got. If nobody else in the building gets a miracle, I'm not even here without it. And so she presses through the crowd until she sees his garment and she reaches out and the Hebrew says and she grabbed a hold of it. And she realized what she did. She let go real quickly and tried to hide herself in the crowd. Jesus stopped. He said, touch me. He was like, Everybody's trying to teach you. Or they about beat us to death trying to touch you. He said, no, 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 no. This was a different kind. I felt something go out there. Somebody touched me with faith. You know what I want to get you get across to you tonight? Faith finds a way to get through. Everybody's dealing with something. Everybody that's in this house tonight had to overcome something to get here. Some of you had to deal with rejection. Some of you don't have enough money to get to work tomorrow. Some of you are facing circumstances and situations that seem overwhelming. And you drug your way into this place. I've come to tell you that the same miracle working power that flowed out of Jesus and healed that woman can flow into you tonight. No matter what's going on in your life, don't quit. She was defined. She was disqualified. She was determined. Oh, God, this story 
is not going to end. I may be at the bottom right now. My life might be in chaos right now. Maybe I don't have enough money to pay the mortgage. Maybe I've made some really bad mistakes in my life, but the story's not going to end like this. I'm not going to quit. You gotta touch him. If you touch us in Jesus' way, wait a minute. Something, something happened. He said, I felt power go out of me. The Greek word is the next word I'll give you. I got one more. It's the word dunamis. Everybody say divine, disqualified, determined. You have the next word. Everybody say dunamis. <laughs> Something about dunamis. Greek word is word for power. It's actually superhuman power. It's a power that exceeds everything that can be deprived naturally. It's the same word that talked about in Acts 10 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Dunamis, who went about doing good and healing all the world, pressed of the devil, for God was with him. It's the same word that Paul used when he said, My speech and my preaching is not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit of God and the power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's also the same word that Paul used when he wrote to the church at Philippi and he said, I can do all things because Christ is strengthening me. It's that word in Deuteronomy. And Jesus said, I felt miracle working power flow out. Somebody got in your heart. I got two things to say. I'm going to give you my last point. I'm going to let you call me your the first thing is, this is the main reason why we've got to preach a gospel of signs and wonders and miracles. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the word of God. He said, how can they believe in him and who they have not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? You see, there's something about the preaching of the word that brings hope. That woman's faith was resurrected not when she saw Jesus, but when she heard about Jesus. When the message was shared, when the gospel was preached, and somebody said there is a man in Capernaum who's healing the sick and casting out devils, faith rose up on the inside of her. Listen, and she talked herself in to walking for three or four days, walking for 30 miles to get to where Jesus was. There's something about the power of the word. That's why we've got to preach it without apology. That's why we've got to preach it without watering it down to make people comfortable. There's something about the power of the word that sets people free. There's something about the power of the word that undoes the yokes of bondage in a person's life and lets them know that Jesus is the answer to their issues. Can somebody shout amen in this house? I, I, I know this is my last thing, but I've got to say this. I'm concerned when I listen to the message that is preached in the church today. We motivate people and we promise them stuff that we can't produce and, and we try to make them feel good about themselves and we Disqualified. Determined. 
Dunamis, here's the key word, water. And he said, water. He was saying to her, maybe we can do something. I know the teachers are going to have all this water. I know the self-righteous have excluded you from being one of them because of all of your issues. He said, but I want you to know I never gave up on you. I never stopped loving you. You are still an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. You still have a destiny and a purpose. And in that one word, Daughter, he, there's, a, there's a multitude of Greek words he could have used. But when he used that word daughter, it was a word of, endear, of endearment where he is saying to her, sweetheart, it's going to be all right. I, I, was, I was reading that and I was studying it. It was a word of affirmation to a woman who has been battered and rejected and beaten down by life. And Jesus was saying to her, even in the lowest moment of your life, I never gave up on you know what I love most of everything I love about God? You know what I love the most? Is that before He called me, He knew everything about me. He knew everything I did. He knew everything I would have done if I'd have had the opportunity. He knows the stuff I almost did. But mercy and grace got in front of me and stopped me from doing it. Come, come on, is anybody? He knows the person I almost shot. Come on, are, are you listening to me? He knows the mistake I almost made. He knows where I was headed that night, but I had a flat tire. He knows what I was about to do, what I would have done. He knows everything about me. He knows stuff my family doesn't know. He knows things that the people closest to me know. He knows things about me that I'm ashamed to admit to myself. Come on, is anybody listening to what I'm saying right now? We can all dress up and look like we got it all together and you know, we're all that in a bag of chips and we can impress everybody around us but Jesus knows what's going on on the inside of your mind. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows the mistakes that you've made and in spite of everything He knows about you, He loved you so much went to the cross not just to die for your sins but John said for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the word destroy in the Greek is to completely undo the effects of the works of the devil in your life in other words when he said daughter he was saying to her and in the next statement he said daughter your faith has made you Come on, say that loud. Your faith has made you. Oh. One more time. Your faith has made you. Oh. He loves us enough not just to forgive us of our sins and then tell us to go forth and continue to work on our issues. He loves us enough to say, when I paid the price for your sin, I also carried your sickness. When the nails were put in my hands, the thorns in my brow, when the nails were driven in my feet, when they mocked and sped upon me, when I suffered and died on Calvary's tree, I paid the price for you to be delivered from every bondage. I paid the price for you to be set free from every shame and every stigma, every label, every hashtag of your past. I'm calling you God. Which means you're an heir. You still have a promise. Look at your neighbor and say, you still have a promise. Come on, tell them, say, nothing you've been through has, has disqualified you from God's plan. My God, I wish I had another 30 minutes to preach it. People can disqualify you. There are going to be people that are going to talk about you the rest of your life. There are going to be people, every time you walk in the room, they're going to roll their eyes and start whispering. But Jesus is standing here tonight and He's saying, Son and daughter, I want you to know there's a new beginning in the old things that passed away and all things be told new. Here's, here's the final thing. You see, she could have been stoned in that culture for touching not just a member of the crowd, but if she even got close enough to the high priest 
and she could have, in their minds, even contaminated him and kept him from his duties, she would instantly be stoned in the midst of the but The writer of the book of Hebrews says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched yeah. Yeah. by the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted just like us. But without sin. What's he saying? He said, you have a high priest that all you have to do is reach out and touch him. Some of you are one touch away from him. You're one touch away from being set free from that addiction in your life. Come on. You're one touch away from God restoring all those things the enemy has plundered and stolen from you. You're one touch away from a new beginning. And He is giving us the invitation. He's saying, whosoever will lay God, touch this high priest. Touch this high priest and be made whole from your issue. Bow your heads across the building. I'm done. Father, I pray for every person in the house tonight. Lord, I pray for those that have carried issues. Maybe it's a spiritual issue. They know they're not where they need to be in their relationship with You. They're in a lukewarm condition. The Holy Spirit is drawing and calling them. Lord, for those that are dealing with physical issues, maybe there's a sickness or a disease or a physical ailment in their in their bodies and they don't know where to look for an answer. Lord, for those that are suffering from emotional issues, they've dealt with rejection, they've dealt with shame and embarrassment and guilt, humiliation from things that have happened in their past, and the enemy has told them that it will never be like it was. Lord, whatever issues we're dealing with in this house tonight, I thank You that You said the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show Himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are right toward Him. Right now, as You're walking among us, figuratively speaking, as we reach out in our faith and touch You, I thank You that miracles are going to happen in this place tonight. I thank You that bodies are going to be healed, that minds are going to be restored, that people are going to go to work tomorrow and find out that God has already changed the environment and turned things around. They're going to get home to find out situations in their marriage has been transformed. That there are going to be miracles that are going to happen in this house tonight. Tonight we're going to hear those words, Daughter, Son, Your faith has made you whole. In Jesus' name. 30 seconds, nobody looking around. Please keep your eyes closed and you head down for just a moment. If you're here tonight, I won't embarrass you, I won't single you out, but if you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm dealing with a spiritual issue. I know I'm not where I need to be in my spiritual walk and I want to get it right. Slip your hand up quickly. I want to pray for you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, let me ask a second question. Maybe you're dealing with a physical issue. Maybe there's a, a, a diagnosis a doctor has given you. Or you're dealing with some kind of sickness or disease in your body and you need to be healed. Please slip your hand up quickly. I want to pray for you. I see those hands as well. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, would you take them down? Let me ask a third question. Is there anybody here that's dealing with a financial issue? You say, Pastor, I need God to do a financial miracle. I, 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 need, I need Him to come through for me quickly. Lift your hand up quickly. That's me, that's me, that's me. All right, can I get everybody in the house to stand with me? You know, this word that I keep hearing in my spirit over and over and over again, I, I said it this morning, but I can't get it out of my can't get it out of my spirit. What has God said about you that you've talked yourself out of believing? You see, the problem is, is He says we're healed, but we look at our sickness and say, "But how can I be healed when there's still pain in my body?" He says you're more than a conqueror, and we look at our lives and we say, "But, but God, you don't understand because I'm still struggling with issues." He says you're the head and not the tail even when you can't seem to get ahead of anything. And our struggle is, is there's this huge gap between what He says about us 
and what we know about us. And it comes down to the point of, are you going to believe when he says, daughter? Because when he says daughter, he says you're an heir of the promise. Which means that even if there's no money in the bank, you're blessed and you're going out and then you're coming in. Which means that you're an heir of everything that heaven has. Is anybody listening to me? And it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. My God shall supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How do you know that, Pastor? Because I'm an heir. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. When he says daughter, he says whatever issue you're dealing with, you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor mights, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other mess shall be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. The question is, are you going to believe Him? Are you going to be that person that says, be it unto me according to your word? If you're in this house tonight and you say, Pastor, I'm ready to believe what God says about me. I'm ready to lay my issues down. I'm ready for a miracle tonight. I want you to move quickly to an aisle and I want you to meet me in the front of this, this building tonight, if you will. I, I, I'm going to share something as we prepare to pray that I, I really don't share very often, but early on in my life I had the privilege of working with several distinguished men of God one of whom was named R.W. Shambach, who was a great tent revivalist. Yeah, yeah. And I had the privilege of working with him, and he mentored me in so many different ways. What a, what a precious, wonderful man. But I'll never forget we were in Cleveland. And it was the last night of a ten-night crusade. There were about 4,400 people there that night. He said, Pastor Tip, how do you know? Because I counted every one of the chairs and put them out made sure they were straight. When you worked for Brother Shambach, you did whatever was necessary. You preached if you needed if he needed you. You led worship if he needed you to. You cleaned up the tent. If he, whatever, you, whatever was needed, you did it. And you did it with a good attitude. Or somebody else did it. 4,400 chairs and the tent was packed. There was a woman that was in stage 4 cancer. Her body was ravished by the disease, probably weighed, I don't know, 75 or 80 pounds. Couldn't even keep clothes on her. Clothes were falling off of her. They had wrapped her in a sheet to keep her covered. Brother Shambach announced that night that he wasn't going to be laying hands on everybody. He was only going to pray for the people on the right side of the tent, which is where... We call it the invalid section. That's where all the people with sicknesses and diseases were. They were on the right side of the tent. He said, I'm only going to pray for them because there were so many people. He would have been there until 3 o'clock in the morning praying. He said, I'm only going to pray for the invalid section. She couldn't get to the invalid section. She was sitting all somewhere, I don't know where, but somewhere on the far left side of the tent. I remember standing on the platform and seeing what looked like a ghost when she got out of her seat, stumbling and barely walking, fragile and frail, sheep falling off of her clothes draped over her body because she was just skin and bones. And I don't know what happened. She started running down that aisle and she fell on the prayer ramp. Brother Shambach went over and laid hands on her simple prayer, walked away and spent the rest of the night praying over the people in the invalid section. This is the last time I saw that woman. For about 10 years, I came back to Cleveland to start Church Alive. Guess who shows up about three weeks into our church launch? Her name was Margo. She said, do you remember me? I, I looked at her face. I said, you really look familiar. She said, do you remember Crystal Springs? That's where the tent was. She said, do you remember Crystal Springs? And I said, oh, absolutely. She said, do you remember the woman on the prayer? I, I said, now I do recognize you, but you look very different. You're, you're twice the woman. You were then. She said, I'm alive. I am healed. The woman is still alive today. 
And she didn't go to my church because she's plumb crazy, and I thank God she goes somewhere else. But, uh, now please edit that out of the video. But, uh, the woman is still alive today, was completely healed, laying on a prayer ramp, and yet I watched other people, as he laid hands for hours on people, I watched people arguing, <laughs> get mad and complain because he didn't take more time to pray for them, and I saw them leave without their need met. I struggled with that. And I said, Lord, I don't understand. I, I, you know, he was almost... You know, he didn't know what was going on with the woman. He just said, you know, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke sickness and disease. Be healed and made whole. However, he prayed just a very simple prayer, and then he moved on. So, Lord, what was the difference? And the Lord brought me to this passage where Jesus said like this. He didn't say my gift. He didn't say my apostolic anointing or my messianic office. He said your faith. Look at your neighbor and say your faith. Come on, tell the person on the other side the one you didn't want to talk to. Come on, talk to him. Tell him to say, your faith hath made you whole. You see, at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Can you just believe that God will do what He says He'll do? Even if you don't have all your stuff together, like that woman still ain't got all her stuff together, but she's alive today and a lot of other folks that were there are dead. Your faith can turn your situation around. Grab the hand of somebody standing close to you. We're going to pray right now. I want you to come into agreement with Pastor. Would you would you come Would you come with me and any of the other pastors that are here? Uh, I'd like you I'd like you uh, pastors to come with me. Thank you so much, Pastor James and Pastor from Lancaster. I'm sorry, your name escaped me. Pastor Abraham, thank you guys. Um, there was another pastor that that I talked to. If he's still here, Pastor Morris. I, I, I want you guys to help me. Here's what I'd like to do. I want to lead him in a prayer. Then I'd like to just lay hands on everybody and just pray over everybody. Whatever your need is, whatever your situation is, we want to bless you tonight. We just want to impart into your life. And here's the thing. If you'll start reaching out right now, this will be your night for a miracle. Be like that woman that says, I'm not going to be where he is and not get what he's got. I've come through too much. I've gone through too many situations. I'm too close to my answer to go home without it. Come on, lift your hands all over the building and we're going to pray right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I come against sickness, disease, and infirmity. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I command cancer to go. I command tumors to disintegrate. I command high blood pressure to be normalized. I command diabetes to be healed. I come against arthritis in the name of Jesus. Every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I command you to submit to the Word of God right now. I command bodies to respond to the prayer of faith. I speak to areas that have degenerated. I speak to organs that are not working properly. In the name of Jesus, be healed and made whole right now. I declare that this is God's property and devil, you cannot touch them. I declare that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is flowing through this house right now. Right now, bodies are being healed. Minds are being restored. Financial miracles are taking place. Addictions are being broken. In the name of Jesus, be set free now. In the name of Jesus, I thank you that it's done. Right now, right now, right now. Now, come on, somebody, hold your hands up and just start praising him for your answer right now. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that your anointing is flowing through this place right now. That you are undoing every work of the devil. That you're destroying every yoke, every stronghold. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Right now, right now, right now, right now, right now. Be made whole in Jesus' name. Be restored in Jesus' name. I command every bondage. I command every work of the devil. I command loss to be restored. I command things that have been stolen to be given back. To be released in the name of Jesus. I speak blessing over marriages, over families. 
demons. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Come on, somebody praise him. Somebody praise him. Hallelujah. We call it down in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, every work of the devil destroyed, every force of darkness going to full retreat right now. I speak to demonic spirits that are bound and tormented. I release you from your assignment on every person in this place. Go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And, and, and let me tell you something. I just heard something. I just heard something in the spirit. I want to talk to people just for a moment that have suffered with addictions. Because they tell you that in addiction, in an addiction status, you never really are free. In fact, that's one of the things you have to embrace when you go to Alcoholics Anonymous or, or uh, um, um, NA, Narcotics Anonymous. You have to embrace the very first thing is, I am an alcoholic. I am a drug addict. But I've come to tell you, in Christ, you may have been an alcoholic, but now you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's the only one that can undo all of the yokes of bondage. I, I, I want to declare to you right now, not only are you free from that addiction... But I'm declaring in the name of Jesus that that addiction, the impulses from that addiction will never ever come back on your life again. That it's not something you're going to have to battle and fight and try to quit, stay clean from. I'm declaring to you in the name of Jesus that you are so thoroughly set free, body, soul, and spirit, that the enemy can never reattach a stronghold on your life in that area again. In the name of Jesus. And there's one other group, that's why I just, I just felt this in the spirit. And I don't want to embarrass anybody, I, I would never do that. But if, if you're in a position where you need a financial miracle, I want you quickly to move through the crowd. I want you to stand as close to me right here as you can. Because I feel an anointing for financial miracles tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And we're not going to hit you up with a $50 seed or any of that kind of stuff. That's not what this is about. How many know you can't buy what Jesus already paid for? Amen. Now, I, I believe in sowing. I believe in giving. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I believe in tithing. Everybody ought to be a tither whether you have a need or not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you can't buy your blessing. Some people think if I give $100, God's going to give me a new husband. He's going to give me a new car. He's going to give me a new house. And uh, You know, the only person getting rich is the person getting $100. Come on, how many hear what I'm talking about? I, I, I don't believe in all that stuff. I believe there are times that God says so and we need to do it. That's, we're not doing that right now. Right now we're declaring the word that's already been spoken. And here's my challenge to you. I want you to watch over the next seven days. I want you to watch God bless you in unexpected ways. And then I want you to document it. I want you to put it on social media or share it with somebody or testify in your church. And I want you to give God the glory for the miracle that's going to happen over the next seven days. Why, why do you need to do that? Because your faith needs to be stretched for you to know that if God said it, He's going to do it. And if He spoke it, He's going to bring it to pass. Are you ready? Are you ready? I want you to take your hands. I want you to hold them like this. I think all of us are ready for a financial miracle, aren't we? Listen, if you're not paid this pay this mortgage off on this building or whatever whatever this church needs, just write them a check. And if you don't have faith to write them a check, leave it blank, they'll fill it in. There you go. Now, it's amazing how the hands come out now. There, there, there we go. All right. You have those hands. All seriousness. Now, I just want you to say this. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I receive every promise spiritually, physically, and financially that you have spoken over my life. I declare tonight in the name of Jesus 
that this is a season of miracles in my life. And that over the next seven days, the heavens are going to be open to me. That you're going to put me in the right place at the right time with the right people or cause the right things to happen. And over the next seven days, a significant financial miracle is coming into my life. I believe it. I receive it. And I promise you that you'll get the glory for it in Jesus' name. Now, come on, put your hands together right now and just thank him. Just thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me how we can accept the idea that there are special services for physical healing or for emotional restoration but get real uncomfortable when God starts trying to bless us financially but he wants to bless you in every issue of your life look at your neighbor and tell him this just I don't care if they're a man or a woman just look at them and call them daughter come on say daughter it's going to be alright and listen if we if, if, if women can be called sons and if men can be called the bride and we're all male and female called the bride come on you can be called daughter for just a moment because we're making a point we're not you know we're not advancing an agenda but just come on one more time just remind them of the covenant it's about the covenant come on tell them say daughter your faith has made you whole would you put your hands together one more time and give God praise to your pastor Pastor. Amen. Amen. Give him praise, church. He's worthy. He is so worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go back to our seats for a moment, church. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, I told you guys, Lancaster, you, you would not be disappointed. Amen. What happened is we, have, we, uh, we know uh, that you guys made a trip to come up here and we were... Hey, for you to just run off, so we do have fellowship downstairs afterwards. We just ask that you hang out, amen, and just uh, take a moment to just fellowship with us. There's refreshments downstairs. But as we find our seats tonight, I want to take up an offer.